Welcome, everybody. It is my great pleasure to welcome Priyanga Amara Sekara for our next IITE seminar today. And she's going to be talking about predicting the effects of climate warming from chemistry to evolution. So without further ado, I will give the floor to her. Be sure to mute your microphones for the duration of the talk. And with that, Priyanga, please, the floor is yours. I'm very pleased to be um, talking to this audience today. And I want to thank Yuri for inviting me to speak to you and giving me this opportunity to talk to you about my work. Um, now, I want to talk about something that I've been thinking about quite a lot lately. Uh, we're living in a world where organisms are continuously being exposed to novel types of environments. Um, oops. Sorry, I'm going to get slide that one. Oh, here. Uh, so the, uh, the argument I want to make is that predicting organismal responses to novel environments requires developing theory that integrates across levels of information from chemistry to evolution. Now, the challenge we all face is de in determining the minimum level of information needed to explain the present and to predict the future. I'm going to talk about this in the context of temperature variation and phenotypic plasticity, not least because temperature is integral to all life processes and climate warming poses one of the greatest threats to life on Earth. Now, organisms use phenotypic plasticity as a strategy to maximize strictness in variable environments. Plasticity is manifested as a reaction norm, the range of phenotypic responses exhibited by a given genotype in response to environmental variation. Now, predicting the effects of climate warming requires knowing where the organisms have sufficient plasticity to respond to current levels of warming, and where the plasticity can evolve fast enough to keep pace with the rapid pace of warming. But existing plasticity is the result of past evolution, and future plasticity is the result of evolution that's yet to occur. So my thesis is that chemistry is integral to understanding both past, past evolution and predicting future evolution. Now, as we know, evolution results from the interplay between selection and constraints. Selection occurs when biotic and abiotic factors generate variance in fitness and constraints the factors that prevent organisms from maximizing fitness even when they have a selective advantage. Now, the, this is the argument I want to make. Temperature imposes constraints on biochemical reactions that are integral to life. And these biochemical constraints in turn limit the set of possible ecological and evolutionary outcomes. I'm going to start by giving you four examples of temperature imposed constraints on biochemical reactions. Data show that the mutation rate increases with temperature in both prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Higher temperatures tend to increase mutations with phenotypic effects. Now we know that most mutations are deleterious, which means that rising temperatures could lead to the accumulation of deleterious mutations. Now data also show that temperature can limit transcription of fidelity. Transcriptional errors can affect the structural integrity of proteins, and errors that evade quality control can disrupt eukaryotic cell physiology. Now, higher temperatures mean more errors and greater likelihood of disruption of protein function. Now, it has long been known that temperature limits enzyme activity faster decline at high temperature extremes compared to low temperature extremes. Data showed that below, above a low temperature threshold, 
the mortality rate of all electrons increases with increasing temperature. This is because all reaction rates increase with temperature. So it's a case of living faster and dying sooner, kind of like a bumper sticker. But the point is that temperature imposes a fundamental constraint on longevity. So we see that temperature can impose constraints on biochemical reactions that are integral to life. Now, the thing, the question we have, and the question we have to address is how do we buy these biochemical constraints limit ecological and evolutionary outcomes? Now, biochemical constraints can limit ecological outcomes by imposing constraints on phenotypic plasticity. They can limit evolutionary outcomes by imposing genetic and demographic constraints. So I'm going to start by looking at how biochemical constraints impose limits to phenotypic plasticity. And I'm going to do this in the context of thermal reaction norms of ectotherms. Now, my focus is on heterotopes because I have a more zoology rather than botany background. And the plants are to come later because I'm still learning about them. And if anyone wants to help me, I'd be very, very happy to be working on plants. So in animal, animal ectotherms, exhibit two different types of thermal reaction norms. One type is unimodal and symmetric with a similar decline at low and high temperature extremes. Reproduction and consumption traits tend to exhibit this kind of response. The second type of response is unimodal and slept skewed with a faster decline at high temperature extremes. Maturation and performance traits tend to exhibit this kind of response. So here are empirical data on develop temperature effects on development in a large number of arthropods you can see that the maturation rate exhibits a less skewed response. And here are data on performance traits with temperature effects on enzyme activity in lizards, tongue flicking and digestion rate in snakes, and endurance and birth speed in lizards. You can see that they all exhibit less skewed responses. And here we have data on mortality which shows above a low temperature threshold, always a monotonic increase with increasing temperature. And these are from large number of different um, insect species. And here we have temperature response reproduction from ranging from ovary number in honeybees, ovary position rate in calcitoids, um, reproductive rates in fruit flies. Here are data for an entire family of very important calcitoid wasps and fecundity in other calcitoid species. You can see they all exhibit a symmetric unimodal response. And here are the data on temperature responses of attack and maximum uptake rates for a large number of species um, forming vertebrates with fish. And you can see that they both exhibit a symmetric Model response. So these, what these data show is that the qualitative nature of thermal reaction norms appear to be conserved across ectotherm taxa. And that's encouraging because what that means is that we can develop a trait-based framework that can apply broadly across different taxa. All right, so the first step in this endeavor is to understand the differences between these two types of thermal reaction norms. And we do this using reaction rate theory. So this is the boltzmann arrhenius function, where K of T is the trait value at a temperature T, temperatures in Kelvin. This is KTI is the trait value at a reference temperature. And A sub K is the arrhenius constant, that determines the temperature sensitivity of the trait, meaning how fast or slowly the trait changes with temperature. And here, 
is a modified reaction rate function that allows the reduction in reaction rates at low and high temperature extremes due to enzyme inactivation. This is theory that was developed based on first principles of thermodynamics way back in the 1980s by thermobiologists. So let's focus on the denominator of this equation. When the magnitude of AH exceeds the magnitude of AL, we get a faster decline at high temperature extremes. In this case, the reaction is weight controlled. It proceeds to a maximum followed by a very rapid decline. In contrast, when the magnitude of AH is equal or similar, uh, similar to approximately the same as the magnitude of AL, we get similar declines at pro and high temperature extremes. In this case, the reaction is regulated, is prevented from proceeding to its maximum. So this difference between rate controlled and regulatory responses is really important. Rate controlled responses are under very strong biochemical control. The reaction proceeds to its maximum followed by a rapid decline. Regulatory responses are, under, are controlled by negative feedback processes that prevent reaction rates from reaching their maximum. So what this suggests is that regulatory reaction norms exhibit, may exhibit similar, experience similar constraints at low and high temperature extremes, whereas rate control reaction norms experience different constraints at low and high temperature extremes. And the data actually support this idea. The low temperature decline occurs due to processes such as freezing of body fluids, which is a relatively slow response, whereas the high temperature decline is driven by protein denaturation and loss of respiratory function, which occur very rapidly. So the key point is that the rate control reaction norms are subject to stronger biochemical constraints at high temperature extremes. So we can see that biochemical constraints can impose limits to phenotypic plasticity. The question is, how do these limits dictate or influence ecological outcomes. I'm going to address this in the context of climate warming. Now, climate warming means exposure to warmer thermal regimes, which means that organisms are more likely to encounter the upper limit of phenotypic plasticity. And we would expect weight control responses to be more adversely affected than regulatory responses. So to make this more concrete, let's look at the thermal reaction norms of lipostate choices. So here are the temperature responses of birth, maturation, and mortality rate on the typical seasonal variation for a temperate species. This blue region uh, denotes the range of seasonal variation experienced by the species in its native habitat. Excuse me. So here the top graph is the temperature responses under typical seasonal variation that we just saw. The bottom graph shows temperature responses under climate warming. The pink and purple areas show uh, the new thermal regime the species is experienced. Now you can see that warming tends to uh, uh, decrease, something of a decrease in the birth rate, but the strongest effects of warming are Fell, experienced by maturation and mortality rates, there's a steep decrease in the maturation rate and a large increase in the mortality rate once temperatures exceed the typical upper limit. So we see that rate controlled responses such as maturation and mortality are more adversely affected by warming than regulatory responses such as birth and attack rates. So of course the question is, 
how we need to understand how these warming effects on thermal reaction norms translate into ecological outcomes. I'm going to investigate this in terms of warming effects on phenology, the seasonal timing of life history events. Now it's well known that warmer winters tend to advance phenological events. Flowers bloom earlier, insects emerge earlier. But if winters are too warm, summers are necessarily going to be too hot. But we know relatively little about what happens during these hotter summers. Now, to understand what happens, we need to be able to determine how biochemical constraints on thermal reaction norms translate into phenological changes at the population level. And to do this, we develop trait-based models of species interactions. So here is a simple depiction of an ectotherm life cycle with juveniles and adults. Juveniles produce adults. Sorry, excuse me, that would be surprising. Adults produce juveniles, juveniles develop into adults, and mortality occurs at each life stage. So here is a mathematical depiction of that state structured life cycle using delay differential equations. This is the equation for the juvenile stage. This is the equation for the adult stage. Recruitment to the juvenile stage occurs through adult reproduction. Losses occur through maturation and mortality. Recruitment at the adult stage occurs through maturation of juveniles and losses occur through adult mortality. Density dependence can operate through fecundity, juvenile mortality, or adult mortality. And here's the maturation function, we need, which incorporates the temperature dependent developmental delays that characterize ectotherm life cycles. This function is critical in predicting how climate warming influences changes in phenology. Because it's so important, let's take a more close look at this maturation function. So maturation of juveniles to adults is a function of three things. The birth rate, ta time units ago times the adult density at that time, that is the total birth rate. The rate at which individuals develop from juveniles to adults given by this, function and survivorship during development, juvenile development. Now, here's the important thing. When temperature varies over time, developmental delay and juvenile survivorship vary with both temperature and time. And these equations give the rate of change of juvenile survivorship and developmental delay with time and temperature. Now, the point here is to appreciate is not the details on the equation so much, but the fact that maturation and mortality play such a key role in ectotherm population dynamics. So there is the full model in all its glory. And what I'm going to do is to analyze this model, both on the typical seasonal variation and warming. I'm going to look at population dynamics under typical seasonal variation for a Mediterranean insect species. So here are the population dynamics on the typical, the phenological pattern over the year on the typical seasonal variation in a Mediterranean climate. Notice that there are two peaks in abundance, a spring peak and a late summer peak. Here are the population dynamics when there's a three degree increase in the mean annual temperature over a period of 100 years. So the black curve gives the, the typical phenological pattern. The blue curve gives the phenological pattern after 100 years of warming. We can see that the spring peak has indeed advanced, but the summer peak is delayed. This is because warmer summer temperatures reduce birth and maturation rates and increase mortality leading to a decrease in abundance. And here are the population dynamics when there's a five degree increase in the mean annual temperature. Now, so again, the black curve is the typical pattern, the red curve is the new pattern. 
So again, we see an advancement in the spring heat, but summer temperatures are so warm that birth and maturation cease and mortality increase so rapidly, leading to a very large decline in summer abundance. Notice now population growth is restricted to early spring and autumn. So we see this pattern precisely because warming has more adverse effects on rate control traits. Hotter summers mean a steep decline in maturation rates and a large increase in mortality, leading to a very large decline in summer abundance. The hotter the summer, the more difficult it is for species to recover from this large decrease in abundance. Now, this is exactly, this warming in this decrease is exactly the pattern observed in disease vectors and pest enemy interactions in real life, it's not just in models. So warming affects vector-borne diseases primarily through vector phenology. So this large decline in summer abundance, because now summers are so much warmer, changes the abundance pattern from a single summer peak to a bimodal distribution with spring and autumn peaks, just as we saw here. So this reduction in summer abundance, if sufficiently large, can cause disease extinction from warmer climates. Okay, so we have seen how an example of how biochemical constraints on phenotypic plasticity can dictate ecological outcomes. The next step is to determine how biochemical constraints limit evolutionary outcomes. There are two aspects to this question, and I will discuss each one in turn. The first is, let's talk about biochemical constraints and genetic constraints. Now, plasticity can evolve in response to warming, provided there's heritable genetic variation. So heritable variation imposes a genetic constraint on the evolution of plasticity. That itself is not so surprising. What's intriguing is that this genetic constraint arises from biochemical constraints on existing plasticity. To see this, recall that Rate control responses are under stronger biochemical control compared to regulatory responses. What this means is that they're subject to very strong stabilizing selection. As a result, they exhibit very little standing genetic variation. Now, this is a hypothesis that we can test by quantifying genetic variation in thermal reaction norms. And we did this using the harlequin bug, which is a, a hemipteran insect that feeds on a native plant species in the California coastal sage spot. This is one of the very few species for which genetic variation in thermal reaction norms have been quantified for the species living in the wild. Now, the experimental methods that were constituted was commonly known as an awful lot of work. I want to go there, it was hard, but it was worth it. And here are the results on the genetic variation in rate controlled and regulatory reaction norms from our experiments. On the left, you see the genetic variation in the maturation rate, which is a rate controlled reaction norm. On the right, you see the variation in the birth rate, which is regulatory reaction norm. Each line, represents a distinct, each curve just represents a distinct genetic line, a gene type. You can see that the rate control reaction norms exhibit very little standing genetic variation compared to the regulatory reaction norm. So what is data? So we saw before that Responses to current levels of warming are limited by strong biochemical constraints on rate-controlled reaction norms at high temperature extremes. 
What this genetic data show is that response to future warning is limited by strong genetic constraints on the evolution of these rate controlled reaction modes. So we see that biochemical constraints can limit evolutionary outcomes through the imposition of genetic constraints. Now I want to talk to you about demographic constraints. And I want to show how biochemical constraints can impose demographic constraints that in turn limit evolutionary outcomes. And I'm going to do this with an interesting biogeographic pattern. Data show that tropical ectotherms are more successful in invading temperate communities than vice versa. The strongest evidence for this, um, excuse me, comes from paleontological and biogeographic data. Diversity at higher latitudes results primarily from taxa originating in the tropics and expanding their distributions to higher latitudes. Taxa originating at higher latitudes and expanding to the tropics are rare, as are reinvasions of the tropics by taxa adapted to higher latitudes. Contem data on contemporary invasions follow, suggest much the same pattern. More successful invaders of temperate habitats tend to be ectotherms of tropical origin with some of the most striking examples, including the cane toad, the Asian tiger mosquito, fire ants, scale insects, marine insects. In contrast, the most successful temperate invaders of tropical habitats are endotherms, such as passerine birds and rodents. So we see a directionality in uh, species adaptation to novel environments. Tropical species can adapt to temperate habitats, but temperate species appear to be unable to adapt to tropical habitats. So of course the key question is why do we see such a pattern? To answer this, we need to understand how reaction norms evolve in novel thermal environments. And I investigate using an eco-evolutionary model that combines the quantitative genetics of reaction norm evolution with stage structured ecological dynamics. I focus on the evolution of the thermal reaction of for reproduction because it's a key component of fitness. It also happens to be a regulatory play with standing genetic variation. So there is no genetic constraint. And this is really important. But it evolves against the backdrop of maturation and mortality rates, which are rate controlled phase, with subject to strong genetic constraints. And the ecological dynamics are given by uh, a state structured model very similar to the one that you saw before. Now, the reason for um, uh, focusing on this a little bit is we saw before with the ecological model that biochemical constraints on rate control responses can cause this large decline in summer abundance. The important consequence of this is that this can predose spell species to stochastic extinction by demographic stochasticity during periods of low abundances. This is the demographic constraint that biochemistry imposes on reaction norm evolution. Now, the feedback between ecological and evolutionary dynamics are given by the mean, given by the mean fitness of the population. This is a function of two important quantities. The mean reaction norm, where X bar is the mean value of the quantitative trait that drives the uh, evolution of the birth rate reaction norm. And density dependent life history trait. The second one is the density dependence in life history traits that drive the ecological dynamics. So here is the full eco-evolutionary model with the ecological dynamics given by the straight structured model you saw before and trait evolution given by this third equation here where x squared is the narrow sense heritability, sigma squared is the phenotypic variance. And the partial derivative gives the selection gradient, the rate at which mean fitness changes with changes in the mean trait value. 
I'm going to use this model to address the two uh, instances that we are interested in. And we to do this by parameterizing the eco-evolution model with temperature response data from two hemipteran species, two hemipteran insect species, from, I mean, hemipteran are insects, um, tropical and temperate latitudes. The tropical species is a pod sucking bug from Benin, Africa, which experiences a thermal radiation characterized by a high mean temperature and low altitude fluctuations. The temperate species is the P aphid from York, England, which experiences a thermal regime characterized by a low mean temperature and high amplitude fluctuations. Temperatures always in Kelvin because I work with these uh, thermodynamical equations. Now, here are the observed reaction norms for the birth rate in the tropical and temperate species. In these graphs, the black line denotes, the vertical line denotes the mean habitat temperature, the red line denotes the optimum temperature, and the dashed lines denote the range of seasonal variation, typical seasonal variation experienced by the species. Now, both these species are native to the habitats they reside in. So it's reasonable to expect that natural selection has shaped these reaction norms to maximize fitness in the organism's typical thermal environments. So what I'm going to do is to compare these observed reaction norms with the reaction norms that evolve in the model. Let's start with the temperate species and beginning with its typical thermal environment. And here, the red curve is the empirically observed thermal reaction norm in a temperate environment. The blue curve is the reaction norm that evolves in the model. So we see that when the temperate species is subject to its typical thermal environment, it evolves the thermal reaction norm for the birth rate that closely assembles the empirically observed reaction norm. Not very really surprising. Well, it's good because it shows that the model is working. Now, let's see what happens when the temperate species invades a tropical climate. Now, something different happens. Exposure to high tropical temperatures cause abundances to fall so low that stochastic extinction occurs before the species has an opportunity to adapt to the new thermal regime. Okay, now let's look at the tropical species, starting with this typical thermal environment. And again, the red curve is the empirically observed reaction norm. The blue curve is what evolves in the model. You can see that when the tropical species is exposed, to its typical thermal environment, it evolves a reaction on that closely resembles the empirically observed pattern. Now let's look at what happens when tropical species are in, in made a temperate time. Okay. So here, the green curve is the empirically observed thermal reaction on for the birth rate in a tropical habitat. The red curve is the empirically observed reaction norm in a temperate habitat. The blue curve is what evolves in the model. So what we see is when a tropical species invades the temperate climate, it evolves a thermal reaction norm that's characteristic of a temperate species. So here's what we see. When tropical ectotherms invade temperate habitats, the reaction norm rapidly adapts to a temperate thermal regime. In contrast, when temperate ectotherms invade tropical habitats, stochastic extinction during the initial invasion precludes adaptation to a tropical thermal regime. Let me explain how this happens, starting with the temperate species. So in these graphs, the top graphs, in these top graphs, the red curve is the typical seasonal variation over the year. The black curves represent change in the maturation and mortality rates over the year. The bottom graph is the delta partners. And here's the key point. 
when the temperate species is exposed to a tropical climate with very high mean temperatures, the thermal reaction norms for maturation and mortality reach their upper limit of phenotypic plasticity. You can see that the maturation rate is the lowest and mortality is highest during the long period of warmer temperatures. As a result, abundances fall to such low levels as stochastic extinction occurs before the species has had the opportunity to adapt to the new thermal regime. Okay, so now let's look at a tropical species invading a temperate climate. The interesting thing is that a tropical species can take advantage of the warmer parts periods of the year in a temperate seasonal climate. And you can see that maturation rate is high during that time. And although mortality is also high, it's much, much lower than the mortality that the tropical species would experience in its native habitat, in native climate. As a result, abundance do not, abundances do not fall to the level at which extinction through demographic stochasticity becomes an issue and the species can persist long enough to adapt to the temperate climate. Okay, so here is a case. There is strong selection, there's heritable genetic variation, but evolution is prevented by the demographic constraint of extinction during low abundances. So we see that the to summarize this, so just to summarize this result on this directionality, we see that rate, we know that rate control reaction norms are subject to stronger biochemical constraints at higher to high temperature extremes. These constraints impose a demographic constraint that precludes adaptation to warmer thermal regimes. The end result is an irreversible, largely irreversible biogeographic pattern. So with that, we come back to the argument that I made at the outset, which is that temperature imposes constraints on biochemical reactions that are integral to life. And these constraints in turn impose genetic and demographic constraints that limit ecological and evolution outcomes. As I noted at the beginning, predicting the effects of climate warming requires knowing whether organisms have sufficient plasticity to respond to current levels of warming, and whether plasticity can evolve fast enough to keep pace with the rapid pace of warming. What we find is that the response to current levels of warming uh, is limited by strong biochemical constraints on wave control reaction norms at high temperature extremes, while the response to future warming is limited both by demographic constraints imposed by rate controlled traits and genetic constraints on the evolution of these rate controlled reaction norms. So, hence my thesis that predicting the effects of climate warming requires development theory that integrates across levels of information from chemistry to evolution. Now, <clears throat> Isaac Newton said this a long time ago, and I say it with a great deal more humility. There's so little we know what, compared to what we could know. <clears throat> but think about this. We know that a hot object cools down spontaneously, but it takes work to make a cold object hot. And we see this exact same pattern. We've just seen a biogeographic pattern where moving from hot to cold is likely, but moving from cold to hot is unlikely. I do not yet know how these two are connected, but I'm hoping to find out. In the meantime, it's not just absolutely marvelous that we see such a, a, a parallel between two such disparate phenomena. So with that, I want to talk very briefly about some future challenges. The first is the need to go beyond enzyme kinetics. What regulates weight processes? 
how do feedback processes such as neural and hormone regulation interact with reaction kinetics? How does temperature affect neural and hormonal regulation, which do not always involve proteins and enzymes? There are steroids and other compounds involved that the temperature effects on which we have very, we know very little about. And the second thing is to understand more about molecular level and biochemical level processes such as mutation and protein function so that we can incorporate mechanistic descriptions of these molecular level processes into models of ecology and evolution. And with that, I will um, acknowledge my funding agencies and most uh, uh, importantly, the Guggenheim Foundation for giving me a fellowship so I can push this work forward and my uh, other funding agencies. And thank you so very much for listening. Thank Sorry. you so much, Bianca. Yeah. And uh, with that, uh, let's turn to questions. If you want to have a question, please raise your hand in the participant list and I will be calling on you. Now I know how to make this thing video. Sorry. Yes, Mercedes. Some people had their hand up before me. Maybe it's fair if you call on them before. Okay. It would be, but I'm, I'm, I must confess, I feel awkward. I see one single hand. Okay, okay. Hand. I saw many hands and they seem to have disappeared. Okay, maybe they were clapping. That's because you, you raised your hand. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Great, <laughs> great talk, um, Priyanka. I have a, a quick question because um, this re rate reaction uh, norms are limited. Uh, so we see, in the, as you said, in the vector born, in the vector transmitted diseases. But of course, this plasticity or these norms already determine the biogeographical distribution. In fact, the places where climate change and climate forcing in general is the strongest is at the lower end or where we see the effects the strongest is at the lower end where climate is so limiting, right? Uh, for example, with altitude, with latitude, et cetera. So that these expansions, for example, for the tiger mosquito or something like this, we see that they are ecological expansions of given, given their current norm, right? Uh, to move into that, uh, to move beyond the limit at the lower tail. Right, so we see that directional movement all the time in altitude, in latitude, etc. I guess my question. So, so really, the the question of how much evolution is involved versus the constraints imposed by the evolutionary norm in the past, right? Because a lot of what we are seeing with insects now seems to be, or at least it's interpreted as just expansion of the biogeographical uh, distribution that is allowed by the norm, right, that you had in the past. So, yeah. so I'm basically asking, it seems like there is this missing question of whether the norm or there is really a change in the plasticity of the of these species as they invade these, these new places, right? Uh, which is not the way we look, at least at vector-borne diseases. And we get these standard, uh, call it norms for R0 or for any other parameter, and then we we just impose them, right, on, on where the species will be able to go, right? But of course, those are obtained often from, from lab strains or lab mosquitoes, etc. So we don't really know whether these expansions evolve ongoing evolution versus just you know expand expanding ra ranges given the norms from the past yeah i so i understand that that's a good point so here's what i want to say so there's tracking of your environment which is that your in current environment becomes too warm the environment just above or below you which whether you're in the north you know on the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere now becomes your favorable environment and you move that that's called tracking 
What I'm saying is there is going to be an awkward, like a forward movement over and above just simply tracking your environment. So that's what this work is showing. And which is true because even before we had warming, you have an influx of tropical invasives into the temperate regions way above where you would think they can survive. So that's one thing. This is over and above, just talking about the current plasticity and a lot of interest. Here's a really interesting thing that one of my students just started to look at, which is that if you look at tropical species, they have much more plasticity than you would just expect from the narrow seasonal variation they experience. Why is that? It's a puzzle, right? But they also experience very large amounts of diurnal variation, much more so than seasonal variation. And I mean, California is like that too. So there's this, this, there's some, some other things we don't know. It's like, why do they have so much more plasticity than they need for their environment? And which is why they can succeed when they move northwards. Whereas the temperate species are at the absolute upper limit of their response threats. They can't evolve to be larger. And so there is that. So first the ecological thing. So there's more than just tracking. And the other thing is that, um, there is evidence of rapid evolution and very rapid acclimation. So here's a, there's a complete, um, very compelling contrast between the high temperature limits and the low temperature limits. The higher thermal, the, what is called the high critical thermal limit is completely inflexible. And you can see why, because of thermal reaction norms. But the low one can evolve very, very fast. They, so within a generation, you can see that the low temperature, so like you're moving from a warmer climate, you can adapt, you can lower your threshold, which is amazing, but it's, it's a slower response. You know, you go to a very top, it's like my analogy for this is like, it takes a while for you to die in the snow, right? You lie down, as you walk into a fire, you know, you're dead within minutes, unless somebody pulls you out. So it's the same thing, it's very hard to overcome like things like protein unfolding, which are irreversible. Whereas when you go to the low temperatures, either you let your body freeze, freeze, freeze or you have anti-freeze. And depending on how much flexibility, species actually do amazing levels, of, they exhibit um, amazing levels of acclimation. So that's the second thing. So the, the movement is above and beyond what you would expect from just simply tracking your environment as the world moves. The other thing about using lab strains and things, and I think, so I do this with a you know, natural, like a species living in the wild. We bring them to the lab and we do the reaction norms. And one of the arguments I would make is that what you expect when you have a reaction norm and you submit the species to one temperature, it should exhibit, you know, what it's, you know, that you should realize the corresponding plastic response, right? So if you do, so the thing is, if it's evolved to the environment that, in the environment that it evolved in and you bring it to the lab and you see something different, you, you don't necessarily know that the difference is because, the difference could be because you're subjecting it to a thermal regime in the lab that is unlike what it evolved under in the field, right? So I have these bugs that are relatively recent, 200 years ago, but I don't know what the thermal regime was like. And they're very interesting. They have a combination of tropical and temperate attributes and they live in a Mediterranean climate. And so there is the thing that, so I see these things, but we measure them also like very carefully. And I know that we do have these issues. So I bring them from the field, right? So they're very much wild, but that is true for other things like mosquitoes where they are lab strains. And, but I have a student who's studying a stored product pest, which has never seen, you know, they live in like granaries or like barns or you're like sacks of grains. It shows the exact same responses, the exact same genetic variation as does my species in the wild. So we need more data to sort of really look at it. And as I said, there's lots we don't know. I've been looking, I just very recently started looking at the, the data for the, the vectors and, uh, and you do see the problems. There are different types of studies, people do them differently. And so you're using other people's data and then there is that issue, you know, is that the right, you know, what do mosquitoes do in the wild? But with at least with these data, uh, I don't have that problem. Yeah, no, it's a super interesting question. I'm just, I'm just saying that typically we take the R0 curve, all these curves as a given, and then just the, what are their implications? 
but that we don't know how quickly they are adapting and how different they are yeah. across their, think, their biogeographical distribution. Yeah, I think the thing to do, and this is very hard, you need to bring in mosquitoes from the wild and do what we do, like you submit mm -hmm. them to these experiments. Yeah. That's, mm -hmm. yeah. Somebody, you need to get somebody to do that. <laughs> Thank you. That's a great question. Thanks so much. Uh, are there any other questions? Well, while we're waiting, I will maybe maybe not even a question, just just a, a little remark. Yeah. That uh, recently we've been uh, playing around with a, a model of climate change and uh, uh, sort of along a spatial gradient. Mm -hmm. Going around the globe, and uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, it's it's very very difficult to adapt to uh, tropical conditions, and it's it's interesting because we, we had a, a compared to your model a, a very cartoon representation of, of quantitative genetics, mm -hmm. which didn't by default have any biases for which direction it is easier or more difficult to to adapt to, but still just based on purely ecological demographic. Uh, uh, outcomes what we've seen is exactly the same yeah that that's actually uh, remarkably right. difficult to go <laughs> into it's the thermodynamics we need to work on this like it's an entropy increase this is what i'm like completely like obsessed with now right like going from you know like it's hot to cold it's you know there's something there that we haven't quite got our hands on you know you see the same pattern and i think we need to that's why i think like it's really true, it's really odd too, right? Because in the old days, the whole thing about the latitude and a gradient was that the tropics are limited by biotic interactions and the, but it's really not true. And when I first started to publish it, I had so much trouble from people. What are you saying? You're going against the grain, but the mortality is so high in the tropics. You live faster, you just go faster. This is why I'm living at to this age because I moved to the Mediterranean fund. No, uh, <laughs> but no, no, it's true. And also like, you know, and this is really kind of an interesting thing. So we talk about exotherms. There are these recent studies showing that human gestation period is being reduced because of the warmer, you know, that's scary, right? Like, I mean, that's like, and, and it's the fetus is under the most insulated conditions, like, with, you know, fluid, like ameliorates all of that. And, so there's something that goes beyond even um, ectotherms. Yeah. But that would be, it would be really nice to see a model. I think we should like, you know, this is the thing, if, if there's something there that I just feel like I, that I am, I, it's eluding my grasp of exactly like what's going on on those chemical reactions or something. So that's good to know there because I feel like very much like this person was trying to like, challenge this like idea about how that you know, gradients work and people like you're crazy. The interesting experiment that nature has done that I think for ecologists is interesting. When we were looking at malaria in highlands, yeah. both going from the 70s to the 90s, you see the increase in the size of the epidemics, right? There was there were a lot, there was a lot of climate variability, very active, etc. At the turn of the century, the, the, there was the so-called slowdown in, in global warming. By the way, no one should interpret that as global warming is slowing down. It was a decadal pattern, right? Mm -hmm. But we see a very clear signature in highlands of these multiple time scales, you know, of, of these decadal changes. And uh, it's a different direction going from the 70s to the end of the 90s very active El Nino's, strong warming, and yeah. then turning around. So I wonder if you look at other insects and you look at where they live in places where they are close to the optimum versus places where they were more limited by temperature, whether we can start seeing signatures of these decadal patterns of variations that, that there actually are a confusing factor over the, the long-term changes. But I think they could be nice ways to think, some, to look at something about the speed at which evolution is actually happening or is it mostly tracking? I think it would be fascinating to use this, uh, this change if you have any data for insects over those decades. 
So what we have is really interesting. So I, I don't, you know, I started working on this insect like when I was a bad student, so like what, roughly 18, 20 years ago. And, but then in those 20 years, California has experienced some of the hottest years on record. So I have data from the beginning with the thermal reaction norms, and we have now animals from the field after that decade of really, really warm temperatures. So we are going to try to do that. I mean, I don't know, they're still more long lived, like, you know, comparatively speaking, they're not that fast. Um, there's not that much fast, that, that fast turnover. So we may not see a difference, but the silla, like the, and also the other thing they said is, is if you have the temperatures, is what we are seeing is, you know, warming isn't uniform. What we are seeing is that the minimum temperature increases faster than the maximum. So there's actually a decline, decrease in the amplitude, but that's not always true for all places. That's true in Southern California. And that's true in general, right? We expect a, a contraction of the amplitude. And that itself is interesting because that's selection pressure in a way more directional and that now you have all this plasticity, right? That sort of kind of is not realized, but, um, you know, it's it's how fast does this evolve, and you know, it's, it's it's a question. So, yeah, we need more data as usual. Uh, feel free to ask more questions if you have thought of any in the meantime. Well, I guess if there are no more questions, then thank you so much again, Priyanga, for the talk. Uh, as I said. So thank you again. Thank you, Priyanga, again, for the thank great you. talk. And uh, thanks, everyone, for coming. Bye. Okay. Oh, and bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks so much. Take care.